Alone among the Muslim nations, Turkey is a country with a dream. For 70 years, she sat on the doorstep of Europe, waiting to come in. But do all Turkey's children really want a European home? And do the ones who keep the faith there think like us? Turkey's always been the odd man out, an eastern country facing west. A nation of 60 million people, the community has told them to reapply in 1993. But is Turkey as European as it looks? Turkey's future lies uh, in looking at the West, and we consider Turkey as a European country. Turkey has always been the bridge between two continents. The modern state has only a European toehold now, a relic of its former Balkan Empire. The old Ottoman capital of Istanbul has always been in Europe. But across the narrow passage of the Bosphorus, Turkey proper is in Asia, separated from the Middle East by a barrier of mountains. The Euphrates and the Tigris, the great rivers that rise in Turkey's highlands, reach the sea in the Persian Gulf. Ancient towns like Gizre guard the borders with the Arab nations. In this part of Turkey, you're a long way from Brussels, far nearer Baghdad. This is the Tigris River, Turkey's border. That village over there behind me is in Syria. Half an hour's drive to the east, and it's Iraq, then Iran, then Soviet Transcaucasia. Now, the Turkish government would have us believe that this is Europe's front line. They guard our southern flank. But is that claim believable, even with the Gulf crisis with Iraq? Does Europe end where it's always done, on the waters of the Bosphorus, a thousand miles away? Or does it end here, on this distant desert frontier? Istanbul. This was a European city once, easy to believe that it could be again. Turkey is a familiar place these days. Big one. In the past, military rule and human rights abuses, Turkey's old bad habits, used to stop us doing business. But the Turks now want to sell us more than the familiar souvenirs. This is where the action is these days. The stock exchange boiled over onto the pavement in 1989. People got the message that in the free market, they'd get a chance to make their pile. Money talks. Turkey was letting Europe know that perestroika was coming. First the economy would be liberated, then politics. It was one man's idea. In the last 10 years, uh, there was a basically a change in the social, economic and political change. There is a new program which we have introduced 10 years ago. And I believe today West generally saying same thing, which I said much, much earlier. Uh, whole free market economy is, can go hand to hand with a liberal democratic system. Turkey is selling her present sunlit image with reminders of her classical European past. Here at Aphrodisias in central Anatolia, Turgut Ozal and his wife Semra have come to play the presidential couple and open a site that attracted a quarter of a million visitors last year. Putting democracy back together after the 1980 coup is proving much more difficult. The politicians know the army is watching every move they make. If they get it wrong and the hurly-burly of democracy disrupts the orderly arrangements of the day, then the soldiers pull the house down. We 
have to make what I call it uh, structural adjustment or maybe much more than that, a transformation. Transformation uh, of a standstill so society to a dynamic society that has been uh, greatly achieved. So far, the powers that be have gone along with Mr. Ozal. Now, some are wondering precisely where he's taking them. President Ozal is a dynamic man with a broad vision, and uh, he has really uh, implemented things that we have not even dreamt of. Uh, he's a strong leader, but uh, what he's implementing now and the liberalization should be more planned, in my personal opinion. Suna Kirac is deputy chairman of one of Turkey's largest companies, Koch Holding. She's a living advertisement for how liberal and modern the country's become. There may be reservations about the Ozal revolution, but Koch has seen its profits spiral upwards. Koch headquarters is an old Ottoman palace on a commanding site above the Bosphorus. <laughs> With the Turkish economy open to the outside world, there's a novel threat of competition, but there are also opportunities. Koch is a giant conglomerate with a finger in everything from fridges to construction to banking. There's one word on everybody's lips, exports. We are hoping to plan to be a multinational company because uh, maybe you have noticed in Turkey most of the companies were uh, designed for the local market. But now that uh, Turkey is export-oriented, uh, our companies are becoming export-oriented. That means cars made here at Tofash, Koch's pride and joy. These Fiat Tempras, one of Milan's latest models, may soon be on their way to Europe. Koch is investing a billion dollars to double production and overtake her rivals. Turkey hopes to beat off the competition with a unique combination, high tech and low wages. The workers get only 80 pence an hour. But with 56% inflation, they want a big rise now. And that could jeopardize the whole investment. Dinner at the Koch home in Istanbul. It may be a billion dollar business, but it's still a family firm. Why? Westerners can feel totally at ease with the people in whose hands Turkey's money is increasingly being concentrated. People like Vebi Koch, who founded the firm, and the next generation who run it. The Kochs feel as European as the wine they drink and the clothes they wear. This small elite now want a tighter bond. Turkey is the body of a Ve bugün Türkiye'ye ihracatının yüzde sekseni sanayi mamurlarındadır. Bundan dolayı Türkiye Batı ile daima işbirliğine devam edecektir ve bu işe yere gidecektir. In this Koç-funded museum, there's scarcely room for all the glories of Turkey's past. The collection pays corporate homage to philanthropy and culture. Fragile relics protected from the shocks of history by the Koch family. These are plates and saucers made for the church and the mosque. The ones with the faces are for the church, and the ones with the designs are for the mosque. The evidence of past intolerance is now confined behind the glass as history. The holy war is over with the West. Those Muslim articles of faith are locked away. It was very different once. In the Middle Ages, all the Muslim world acknowledged the Turkish Sultan. And Europe's ambassadors to Istanbul knew that Turkey was more than a match for the West. In 1683, Christendom trembled as Suleiman II took his armies to the gates of Vienna. But that was the high watermark of Ottoman power. Two centuries of decline began 
the Turkish bogeyman became the sick man of Europe. The Ottoman Empire died on the battlefield in the First World War. The Sultan sided with the Germans and shared their fate. Defeat for Turkey meant dismemberment. Greeks, the most ancient of Turkey's enemies, ruled again in Istanbul. The Turkish heartlands were given to Greece and to Italy as colonies, as the victors took the spoils of war. One man, Mustafa Kemal, stood between the Turks and national extinction. He was an army officer who'd made his reputation at Gallipoli. He raised a new model army to fight for independence. Turkey had learnt the crucial lesson of how to be a disciplined and military nation. By 1923, the war was over. A grateful people hailed the army and its leader. General Kemal rebuilt society. He changed his name to Ataturk, father of the Turks. He taught them to wear Western dress like him. He hobnobbed with European monarchs as an equal. The European alphabet was introduced. It was a cultural revolution. No more oriental fashions, strange new customs. Derby Koch was an eyewitness to it all. Büyük millet peşinde açıldığı 21 senesinde Atatürk'ün verdiği lütufta bulundum ve kendisini orada dinledim. Atatürk çok giriş düşünceli, çok mühim bir insandı. Atatürk, Türkiye'nin istikbalinin batıda olduğunu söylemiştir ve bu hedefe doğru Türkiye'yi yöneltmiştir. Atatürk died in 1938. He is not forgotten. Like Lenin, they made a mausoleum for him. Foreign visitors pay their respects. Atatürk's sarcophagus is the Ark of Turkey's political covenant. He left behind a conservative political movement called Kemalism. Kemalism has become a state religion. Its guardians are not priests, but soldiers. Every day, a fresh lesson in the cult of Atatürk, a tour around the leader's relics. Children are taught that the Republic is secular, not Islamic, that the West is the model, that the watchwords are peace at home, peace abroad. Nowadays, the soldiers add democracy to the list of what they safeguard. But democracy must fall in with the Kemalism they watch over. Turkey is a democratic country, although we have had two coups in between uh, the last 20 years. Uh, I think army is the guardian angel for Turkish democracy. So uh, Turkey is a democratic country and it's going to be unified with Europe. Islam has been the custom of the people here for virtually a thousand years. Under the new republic, the state discouraged public piety in the hope that religion would wither on the vine. But Islam had cut too deep into the fabric of Ottoman society and the patterns showing through again. In the 1980s, a religious revival has gathered pace in Turkey. President Ozal's economic changes have brought country folk flooding into town and they've brought the old religion with them. Kemalism copies Europe. Its day of rest is Sunday. But as more people go to Friday prayers, fundamentalism's becoming difficult to ignore. My father uh, was a religious man, I mean, uh, with some uh, religious identities, claiming himself as an Islamic man with his uh, beard. My, my mother was uh, covering her hair. Nobody cared about this because he was a shopkeeper and uh, she was <coughs> Uh, tending home. But uh, when I became a journalist, and my, uh, when uh, my wife uh, has become a 
lecture at university, they started minding. They started uh, feeling awkward about our uh, coming to that places. Femi Koru owns a Muslim newspaper called Zaman. It sells 100,000 copies every day to the new educated classes. Despite appearances, he says he doesn't feel a European. The readers, like the staff here, take their religion seriously, and they don't care who's watching. They're fighting a battle of traditions and ideas. You can measure the progress of that silent battle on the building sites of Turkey. Everywhere new minarets are rising, but where does the money come from? The government says that mosques are built by private enterprise, but the Department of Religious Affairs has suddenly had its budget more than doubled, and no one seems to know where the money's going. And the special schools for training future mullahs have had a lot more money from the government. Arabic and religion are on the syllabus. They're turning out 70,000 pupils every year. One in eight university graduates comes from these schools now. Ataturk must be turning in his grave at the thought of computer programmers in Perda, not the future he commanded. And many of these lads will not be taking up careers as clergymen. And that's what worries Do Parinchek, editor of the left-wing magazine Yuzil. Do Parinchek is a veteran of struggles with the fundamentalists, and he's worried at what the future is going to bring. Yönetimi ele geçirmiştir. Birçok yerlerde kuvvetlidir ve bu da zaten pozisyonu, durumu son derece karmaşık hale getirmektedir ve Türkiye'yi çok sert hesaplaşmalara doğru itmektedir. Fundamentalism now is an item on the Turkish political and social agenda. Of course, when there is an item on the agenda, it should be dealt with. And I think uh, fundamentalism is an issue which the governments should handle very delicately. But firmly. And firmly. Mrs. Kiraj hopes that the problem will be solved by enlightenment and education. But in the past, challenges to Kemalist orthodoxy brought in the army. Today, the soldiers keep well out of the limelight. But this was a NATO exercise, our only opportunity of getting near the Turkish military. It's a conscript force, almost a million men. It's not like Latin America. The generals don't like taking power, but they don't like breakdowns in law and order either. So they keep on taking over the government. They've done it three times since 1960. The last time was just 10 years ago. The senior officers who carried out that operation are now retired. Some are prepared to talk. They created a nation under the leadership of Kemal Atatürk. So once you create something, you want to keep it. <laughs> you want to keep it in a good condition, where it's supposed to be. That is the feeling you have to uh, to protect your country from uh, the threat that can damage and jeopardize the peace and security uh, of the country. Internal that, threats as well as external threats? Well, if the dimensions of internal threats, I mean, gets, uh, jeopardizes the, uh, the country's independence and sovereignty and that sort of thing, and then uh, you have to think that that's a, that's a great threat. It was the street violence of the 70s that prompted the last coup. The soldiers argued provocation. As extremists clashed with casualties in the thousands, the soldiers cleared the field. The army blamed the politicians, especially the left. Thousands were arrested and tortured. The political parties were dismantled. 
Searching for allies against the left, the army decided to let Muslim fundamentalism grow. In 1983, as they relinquished power, the army chose the new prime minister. He was Turgut Ozal, a conservative from a religious background. Turgut Ozal has moved forward as the military stepped back, a civilian figurehead. But no one was able to tell us how much Ozal still owes to the army. Can a figurehead come to life? It's hard to tell because he's always on the move. Last year, by an amazing piece of acrobatics, he made himself the president. With one bound, he was free and off to the White House to make foreign policy on his own. Welcome back to the Oval Office. Mr. Ozal breaks the rules of cabinet democracy. When he went to talk to Mr. Bush, the Turkish foreign minister went with him, but the two presidents monopolized the Oval Office photo opportunities, and Mr. Ozal spoke to Mr. Bush alone. I do not think that even prime minister does not know what really Mr. Özal has discussed with President Bush about the Gulf crisis, about the Turkish commitment. Nobody knows. According to the Constitution, we, are, we have the parliamentarian system. We do not have the presidency system. But after Özal, Mr. Özal became the president, to our opinion, against the Constitution, against the law, against everything, against the parliamentarian system, he tries uh, to practice the presidential system, and that is a problem. And uh, actually, he has a big responsibility to actually to, to, to collapse the system. The system is collapsing because of his personal uh, attitude and behavior. Your critics say that you're carrying out a constitutional coup, giving yourself I'll give, you, I'll give you an English copy of uh, our uh, constitution, you study it. It's a kind of copy, basically, many articles is, has been copied from the French constitution. But that is like a motor car, it depends how fast you drive it. <laughs> uh, that depends upon the, who is on the presidency in Turkey. And you're a fast driver. I am a fast driver, yes. <laughs> The Ozal Roadshow is impressive, but has it given Turkey's politics anything but a facelift? The structural damage from that collision with the tanks is still to be repaired. But the military handed back authority only in the west. Take the old Silk Road to the east and it's a different story. This is the city of Diyarbakir. It boasts the longest stretch of medieval walls still standing anywhere. This is another country that dances to the rhythms of the Central Asian steppes. Beyond the reach of package holidays, a very different atmosphere to the Turkey of the West. Different people too. Many here are Kurds, not Turks. Economic liberalization has brought no progress to the East. Instead, it's meant an end to government-funded factories and jobs. The 15 million people in the eastern provinces are getting poorer. Since the military coup, 10 provinces in eastern Turkey have remained under strict administrative rules or martial law. Our activities were constantly monitored. We were accompanied by the police most of the time. But the security forces were shy of the camera and went to some trouble to avoid being filmed while watching us. The Diyarbakir Human Rights Office has been watching the activities of the security forces for some time. I went there to find out if European codes of conduct were being taken seriously. You go up five flights of stairs. Even so, the police follow you. The office is run on a shoestring. They collect evidence of the systematic torture of suspects. Hatib Dishle, a local lawyer, is the link with Amnesty International. The government told us that torture was just an old bad habit the police had picked up and which would die away given time. But Hassan Beksek, a member now of the Human Rights Committee, has already been tortured three times. 
The last time was in July. He was arrested in the early hours, accused of sympathizing with extremist groups. This is the village of Mahamadiya. The locals call it Inji, but not in the hearing of strangers. Inji is a Kurdish word, and the Kurdish language and culture are officially forbidden. This is a place that history forgot. If Western Turkey has an economy a bit like Greece, this end of the country looks like Bangladesh. Haji Ali is old enough to remember the Ottoman Empire under which he was born. Not a great deal has changed since then. In these parts, Europe is a word people don't quite understand, and community is just about all they've got. Incomes in this part of Turkey can be as low as three or four dollars a week. <laughs> Any savings these villagers once had have been eaten up by inflation, and life for many would be impossible without help from outside. New cars are a rare sight in this village. This is one of the local boys made good, come to visit his uncle's house. The young man lives these days in the town of Adana. He helps support the family. His grandmother would be destitute without his help. This family is lucky, but there's an undercurrent of resentment. <laughs> If things go on like this, only the eagles will remain in the mountains around Mohammedia. People are leaving in their tens of thousands, and poverty isn't the only reason. These are the Judy Mountains in the far southeast, fringing the border with Iraq. They're an increasingly dangerous place to live. The ugly little war between the Turkish army and the Kurdish separatist guerrillas of the PKK is getting worse. Last year, hundreds of people were killed, and locals say that the real figures are far higher than official estimates. But the authorities discourage visitors here, and they're not at all happy with anyone taking photographs. So from this point on, we have to leave the big camera behind. There's an enormous build-up of troops in this area. 
we used a concealed camera so as not to attract attention. The trouble in the mountains started to escalate 18 months ago, long before the Gulf crisis began. The soldiers are edgy, there's fighting going on. We were advised not to leave the main roads because of landmines. What began six years ago as Kurdish separatist terrorism is now turning into something worse. Almost 30 mountain villages near here have been destroyed and their inhabitants forced to leave. Anyone found there now is assumed to be hostile. To create a free fire zone, these Kurdish villagers were deported this summer. They're squatting here near the road outside the town of Shurnak. <laughs> These people were only allowed to take away what they could carry with them. They lost most of their livestock. They're now too poor to build a house or buy a bus ticket to the town. And the refugees are already running out of food and fuel. Winter here brings three feet of snow. Local people told us that 30,000 villagers have already been evicted in this area alone. An iron fist policy now finds its excuse in the Gulf crisis. <laughs> Who seems to be in charge here? Is it the civil authorities or the military? Askeri Otorite. In the battle for hearts and minds, the separatists are making progress. On the outskirts of Gizre, a little town at the foot of the mountains, displaced villagers are building houses. The population here has doubled in the last five years. That figure is based on the census. One day, every five years, everyone is confined to their homes while officials count them. Edip Bulbul has lived here all his life. He has eight children and no job now. He'll probably join the surge of people leaving here for Istanbul or Dusseldorf. In a ramshackle building on a mud street, one of Jizre's lawyers has his office. Orhan Doan trained in Ankara. But under the emergency regulations, there's a limit to what lawyers or politicians can do to help when people come to them in trouble. <laughs> Mr. Doan wonders why there's no end to the economic and political pressure on the south and east. We wondered why no one else in Gizre, even government officials, were prepared to talk to us. Mr. Doan has had a little trouble himself. In August, someone put a bomb against his house. Back in the big city, we made fresh attempts to get the civil governor or the military to comment on what we'd seen. Like others before us, we were not successful. Turkey's new politics have yet to reach the Arbakir. The trappings of democracy count for little in this town. Power wears a uniform, is shy of being interviewed, and keeps its distance from the people, too. The question is, is Diyarbakir a backwater that's always had a firm hand, or does the secret state within the state that shows its face here 
Rule also in the West, just better veiled. Heroic sculpture stands guard outside the new Grand National Assembly. Heroic efforts are required to make the system work. The military decided which parties are allowed to sit here. There's deadlock. Mr. Ozar's government cannot get its bills approved to the frustration of his motherland party of which brother Kurkut Ozal is a member. And who will answer questions about the assassinations that are frightening the establishment? Someone's serving notice on Turkey's latest experiment with democracy. 17 prominent intellectuals and government officials have been killed this year. The police are still looking for the culprits. The government said they're fundamentalists or the left, but people remember the 70s. The road that led to military intervention started with assassinations just like these. As the funerals multiply, doubts about official explanations grow. Alarm about another coup is spreading. Muslim politicians who have the most to lose from violence see the murders as a weapon aimed not by Muslims, but at them. And you get that same story even from their political antagonists on the left. Şimdi bir hesaplaşma başladı ve o hesaplaşmanın ilk kurşunları da atılmaya başladı. Bizde politik mücadele her zaman nazik ve centilmence olmuyor. Artık şiddet sahnededir. Bütün kapıları açan anahtar, bütün çözümler şiddetle gerçekleştirilmiştir. Ve bugün bu derin kriz kaçınılmaz olarak şiddeti getirmiştir. Ve yalnız İslamcılar değil, devletin illegal güçleri de ve Amerika'nın desteklediği bu illegal güçler de şiddet kullanmaya başlamışlardır. With turmoil threatening, the Turkish establishment is working against time to complete its economic program. Wealth may yet heal the country's wounds. This is the Atatürk Dam, fourth largest in the world, and centerpiece of a massive hydroelectric and irrigation project. Cotton will be the raw material for an industrial revolution in the industry in which Turkey has long planned to be a world beater. textiles. Modern factories are already creating export markets. Market dominance will bring better wages, and the discontent accumulating in the factories may diminish. King Cotton needs free trade if he's to make Turkey's fortune, and that depends on pleasing Europe and the West. But then Europe isn't the only option. Hello, how are you? This corporate reception is for Soviet visitors, Turkish speakers from the southern fringes. <coughs> there are other plans, a Black Sea trade zone, an Islamic common market. Turkey's economy has to grow at 7% a year just to stand still. Industrialists have the fate of Turkey in their hands. We keep talking to the uh, industrialists and their uh, unions, you know, employers' unions and the uh, workers' unions, uh, and we try to uh, explain them to the facts of life. Uh, we have not been, I have to admit, we have not been very successful. If the industrialists fail you, though, and you don't keep up that growth rate of 7%, what happens? Why do you ask me that? <laughs> I know, you know the result. <laughs> You're saying that Turkey now has to run very fast, that you have no option. Yes. Uh, any country uh, which has uh, a young population uh, like Turkey has to run very fast. Sprawling around the cities, Turkey's shanty towns, the Gecekondus, show the problem at its starkest. The birth rate is getting dangerously close to 
Turkey is running out of time because it's overrun with children. Turkey needs half a million jobs a year to keep these people even in these conditions. With the 50% inflation and wages of $12 a week quite normal, there's a time bomb ticking under everybody's plans. The stubborn patience of the Turks is legendary, but how much longer can these people wait? Fakir halk tabakaları da bizi destekliyorlar. Onun da sebebi bu topluluklar şu anda tatbik edilen kapitalist düzen içerisinde eziliyorlar. İstiyorlar ki kendilerine daha rahat bir hayat imkanları olsun. Ancak buna bu sistem içerisinde kavuşamıyorlar. Don't let the language fool you. Refa is not the party of Marx, but the party of God. Party HQ is next door to the mosque, and it's a vote winner. In last year's local elections, Refa won one vote in six. But will the powers that be ever allow Muslim democracy to win a general election? There are people in this country with very close minds. Would uh, this one time, one uh, at the one hand, claiming to be democratic. On the other, they would uh, sacrifice democracy on the altar of secularism. Fear is spreading in every part of Turkey, but in the east, the prophecies of violence are more urgent. Türkiye 12 Eylül rejiminden önceki günlerden çok daha vahim bir tablo içinde. 12 Eylül rejiminden önce olmayan bir güne doğuyla karşı karşıyayız. Ekonomik çöküntü bir hayli fazla. İşsizlik, enflasyon oranı rejimden önceki dönemle mukayese edildiğinde gerçekten maksimum düzeylere gelmiş durumda. Bence e, bir ihtilal için olgun şartlar hazırlanmaya zorlanabiliyor da olabilir. Ataturk tried to make a Western nation from an Eastern mold, but discipline is not enough. The Kemalist experiment is out of step with modern Turkey. Is Turkey the last country in Europe or the first nation of the Muslim world? That's a question that can't be answered until the soldiers finally march away.